Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, ready to go. Uh, as we learned from Veritech, thank you very much. Uh, hydrogen helps fleets reach zero emissions in ways that batteries simply cannot. Uh, specifically, it refuels vehicles in minutes rather than recharging them over hours, uh, making it particularly well suited, again, as Veritech noted, uh, for heavier duty diesel type vehicles. Um, so we also see hydrogen complementing batteries in the future, uh, very much in the same way that diesel complements gasoline today. Um, but as many recognize, there's an infrastructure problem here with hydrogen uh, and a long-standing chicken and egg issue, uh, with some quipping that hydrogen is the fuel of the future and always will be. Um, we have a way at our company to overcome this problem now, <clears throat> problem, excuse me, uh, rather than waiting uh, for the indefinite future. And so speaking of now, uh, there have been some big recent announcements for green hydrogen. And here is a sample of them. And what's important to note here is that we're talking about production of uh, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen in the tens of tons per day uh, with the impetus of bringing down the unit cost for green hydrogen. Um, obviously this scale represents a very large step away from today's current production and use of hydrogen, uh, which is really uh, almost nothing in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, hydrogen fueling. And the problem is that use. As far as vehicle fueling goes, no stations exist outside of California. And California has gone after the commendable but wrong target of passenger vehicles. This has forced build out of a network and has failed to match fueling capacity uh, with the offtake. And therefore, these projects have been saddled with low equipment utilization, probably as low as 20% across the California network. So we see this production at scale and the larger scale as actually worsening hydrogen's chicken and egg problem for now, making a large step even larger. In contrast, we feel strongly that a ramp is needed to connect today's reality with tomorrow's leap to a hydrogen at scale future. Our approach involves meeting customer fleets where they are today at that zero hydrogen adoption level. Our approach focuses on centralized fleets, so there's no need for that day one fueling network. Our approach makes hydrogen on site, so there's no worry about delivery hiccups that have plagued uh, California's system. And finally, our approach makes hydrogen from water, so we can scale it down to serve as few as 10 to 15 vehicles not hundreds or thousands as would be required in that tons or tens of tons per day uh, capacity range. Um, with our uh, manufacturing partner, we've designed a modular system that maxes out at only 200 kilograms per day. That's about a 10th the size of the large stations out in California. Our entire system fits in just three containers that only need water and electricity as inputs. Most important, by working with our fleet partners, we know the fuel demand on these stations in advance and therefore can keep our equipment utilization high and affordable hydrogen available for our uh, fleet partners. Uh, just like uh, with Veritech, uh, we, saw, we, we see a very large uh, opportunity here, multi-billion dollar market potential, if you believe Princeton and McKinsey, and we do. When this goes big, it goes big. What is important is starting now. And that's exactly what we're doing with our initial project here in central Denver, Denver, Colorado, that is US. Uh, interest and support uh, for this project is coming from at this point, seven name brand fleet partners so far. Um, further, we've been awarded a $250,000 grant from the state of Colorado to catalyze this initial project and have already held kickoff meetings and in second uh, meetings uh, with our fleet partners this past February. We see this initial microhub approach, approach as replicable and repeatable across North America. And we've already started pipeline conversations with entities on both coasts, as well as in Canada. Our project timeline anticipates a seed round is closing soon and is followed by a series A to get us to five microhubs. Beyond that, we move into equipment lease financing to support further, faster growth. We hit 50 microhubs by the end of 2028 with 12 million EBITDA. 30 second warning. Okay, thank you. Uh, by 2023, we achieved nearly 200 microhubs and have 58 million EBITDA and 75% IRR for investors. In this manner, we've established early market share and become a good target, we think, for M&A from those large production players we talked about. 
Today, we're a team of two founders, lean and with a simple cap table, uh, but we have deep experience in sustainability, startups, project management, project delivery, and operations. Most important, we have the drive to carry this operation forward. Time is up. Two years to developing our approach and are ready to take it to the next level. How much are you guys raising quickly? Will I bring the other investors? There in? It is, yeah. Three million seed. Uh, that unlocks that $250,000 grant. Uh, completes our first project in Denver, gets it up and running, uh, along with priming a couple others uh, and, and further uh, getting our pipeline uh, underway so that we can meet those growth production projections. Very cool. Then I would hand things over to uh, Shanice. Do you want to take things away? Let's do it. Um, well, first of all, really excited about the hydrogen economy. So great to see two startups here on that front today. Um, two questions for you, Seth. The first is, when you think of the climate capital stack, how are you thinking of project finance versus venture capital for funding this? And then the second question is, can you give us more context on the scale of the centralized fleets that you'll be working with today? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so as far as the, the capital stack goes, um, you know, I'm anticipating that to get to those those first, uh, you know, prove out the model, get our get our stations implemented, uh, to, you know, show that we actually can can uh, locate these uh, customers, develop these micro hubs, uh, both the supply and the demand. Um, that really that those those the initial dollars that come in are probably uh, VC. Um, that said, uh, we are aggressively pursuing uh, grant applications uh, and opportunities there to, to try to extend any kind of a runway that we would get or potentially decrease that Series A raise uh, that I, that I was uh, speaking about. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, we believe that once we've uh, proved out the business model, we can move to that equipment lease uh, financing uh, capability or a project uh, financing capability and start using layering debt in here on top. That's a little bit uh, less expensive, of course, than, uh, than the VC money. Um, but at any rate, so, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're going to start with VC, I think, um, but we would try to, you know, use as little of that in the future as possible you know, to protect uh, current investors and obviously uh, to, to, to make our projects uh, leverage that much better. Uh, as far as a context on scale, I think that that really is the important component of what we're doing here. Um, we're, as I indicated, looking at probably 10 to 15 uh, vehicles per micro hub in order to support the cap capacity utilization uh, that we, we, we feel is necessary to get to affordable hydrogen. Um, so this means that we can actually start looking at uh, smaller fleets uh, and groupings of fleets in order to, you know, like we're doing here in our Denver project, you know, trying to assemble, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, fleet players in here so that each one of them is only talking about one or two vehicles uh, on their own. Um, so that's that helps. But that said, you know, some of the players here we're talking to are utilities. They have, you know, hundreds of vehicles uh, that, that potentially could be, you know, converted over to this. So with success of this project, Potentially, you know, they could take a small portion of their fleet and start turning that over to to hydrogen uh, consumption, hydrogen use uh, as part of their 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 normal turnover and adoption into zero emissions. What's the range going to be for hydrogen comparable to uh, diesel or gas? So, how many yeah. hydrogen stations are you going to actually need? So that's that's a, again another uh, I think important part of what we're doing is that we're not trying to initiate a network day one, not trying to boil that ocean as they're doing out in California right now. Rather, we're going after centralized fleets, and really the the, the important component there is the ability to refuel, replenish that range on these vehicles in a very rapid manner, minutes as opposed to hours. Um, so, you know, the range on it depends, of course, on the on the vehicle size, depends on the operator, depends on, uh, you know, ambient temperature, other considerations. Most of these, you know, obviously hit us in our in our normal gasoline or diesel vehicles today, but we're relatively insulated from those because we can refuel so rapidly. When you move into a battery world, the, the penalty gets a, significantly higher. Uh, for doing that. And so, you know, for example, and there are transit systems that have, you know, centralized uh, charging for their uh, buses, uh, but are also adding uh, range extenders, you know, at the end of 
uh, of, of routes so that the you know, bus driver can take a 30 minute break to just top off a little bit and be able to continue uh, uh, servicing that route. Um, and then there are just some routes that are just too long and that really are not going to be a candidate for you know, reasonably for batteries ever. Can you can you talk a little bit about the differentiation of your technology from all the other technologies out there that are you know using this a similar approach of solar energy plus water as inputs and and how do you your technoeconomics work out? I'm not clear what the edge here is with your technology versus existing approaches in the market. Yeah, so I, the the edge here is that we're we're going after and we're doing the hard work of assembling these hubs, you know, both that supply and demand, and that we're able to do this, you know, with a reasonably sized chick egg, you know, the chicken and the egg at the same time, uh, getting to that problem. Whereas if you if you just start, you know, making uh, more and more hydrogen, it doesn't help the economics around around the system. Um, so you know, we are an integrator of the technology that goes inside of mm -hmm. our containers. Um, that gives us, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, a, 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 a price and efficiency advantage, advantage going forward as we proceed down the experience curve and are able to take advantage of, you know, of, of, of manufacturing capabilities that start take, taking the cost for the, you know, the main component of what we're doing, the electro electrolyzer down. Uh, Rethink Energy thinks, for example, that that uh, price is going to go down by as much as 85% over the next uh, decade. Um, so we would like to, to, to follow that. Uh, down as we go, producing you know cheaper micro hubs, uh, cheaper hydrogen as we go forward. Um, but as far as you know, actual hard technology, you know that's not our first uh, you know primary concern here. We're really trying to get out, storm the hill uh, where there's a lot of white space opportunity, particularly over here in the U.S. right now, um, and grab that early market share so that we can be you know a a, a very uh, you know, approachable uh, target for uh, for M and A activities from some of the really large players that are on the way. You know, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law and other you know very large incentives that are uh, that are available here in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. Are there any network effects or defensibility? Like the one thing I would worry about is you help build this out, you help bring the prices down, you help do everything so that your competition can come and cut your throat. And there's lots of other players that come in and the prices get dragged down, and it's a uh, the winner yeah. is the last one. The winner is not the first one. It's the last well, one you think of. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think there, there's, there's absolutely that risk that you know we get out and you know we're, we're the, we're the guys that get shot in the back if, uh, you know, if, if, if the, the scenario that you're playing out is the one that takes place. But you know what actually happens, I think, is that you know we get out, we initiate uh, the early market, you know, in a particular uh, locale, and we have a, we have you know contracts on the on the hydrogen that's sold, and those carry forward. Eventually, yes, I agree, there's going to be, you know, the big green hydrogen uh, uh, pr producer, the, the uh, refinery with the, you know, delivered hydrogen option that, you know, is able to undercut. The nice thing there is that we, so we still have that, uh, that, that relationship uh, with those fleets in place. Uh, and really, all we do is pull out the electrolyzer and move that to another, you know, more far-flung uh, uh, location that is actually extending the uh, the network. You know, we can leave the storage capacity, the dis uh, the dispensing capacity, right in place, and we just start receiving cheaper hydrogen because that's what local economics dictate. And mm -hmm. in the meantime, you know, we go from a you know a, a point to you know call it a seed, if you will. Uh, to something that looks like a branch along a corridor as you start stacking a couple of these uh, along Thank one you. another. And you know, when, then once you get off that trunk, rather, you start making branches off of that as, as you, you develop this network you know, kind of organically, as right. opposed to trying to build it all at once as they're doing in California. Right. And well, part of building that network has a real estate aspect or dimension of real estate associated with it. How are you thinking about land acquisition and 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 you know, especially in cities, uh, there is a high degree of NIMBY activity, <laughs> you know, and and yeah. local politics can be a big rate limit to to building such hubs. Uh, yeah, and that, that's what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's another place where I think that we have, you know, a very uh, uh, elegant solution here in terms of you know being able to put something in that is very small, uh, that is is containerized. And is modular so that it can fit on um, you know, marginal pieces of property 
Um, everybody that we've spoken to thus far, you know, we're not talking about acquiring the land. We just want the the offtake agreement, the contract that goes along with uh, the fueling of those of those vehicles. Um, so we are we're, we're not in it, you know, as a real estate play. Uh, we're in it as a as a as a grab on that uh, on that con early contract in order to to set up that early market share. And thus far, you know, given the size of what we have and the configurability, uh, the flexibility that goes along with that, uh, we're not meeting any resistance. You know, these these can be cited in a parking lot pretty easily. This might this might be a dumb question, but if it can be put in a parking lot so easily, why not franchise this to gas station owners and say your future is dead unless you roll out something like this? They pay you, then you don't have all of the complexity. Yeah, and then that it could be okay. Um, you know, again, a, a gas station typically doesn't have an awful lot of uh, real estate with it, and nor does it necessarily have that devoted fleet. Um, so we're, you know, we would happily site, you know, uh, in a with a gas station, uh, but really we're we're agnostic as to you know where we site as long as there's sufficient land and the the presence of those centralized fleets. Uh, so, for example, here in Denver, we're uh, we're associating with a, a group that is doing revitalization around the National Western Center, around a disadvantaged uh, community that has been very transportation impacted, uh, you know, from perspective of pollution as well as having interstates that have actually cut up uh, the neighborhood into quadrants. And so there is actually uh, you know a strong interest from the neighborhood in uh, trying to lead with both the zero emissions uh, alternative that would help benefit their, uh, their their emissions in the in the local area as well as potentially putting them at the fore of what would be a, a large growing industry. And you mentioned solar earlier to power this. Are you still dependent on local electricity grids, or is that solar enough to power the electrolyzer? And if you are, then how do you think of siting where maybe the grid is already pretty strained? Um, so yeah, so our, our we are are clearly focusing, and you know, we don't want to deliver hydrogen. Uh, there are, are are costs and problems associated with doing that. Um, we would rather produce on-site fossil-free uh, hydrogen. Yes, we are uh, absolutely pulling off of the grid because of that. Uh, we don't, you know, our, our, especially if we're located in, you know, an urban area as we anticipate our first one to be. You know, we're not going to put up a, a, a field of solar or or, or large wind to, to 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 bring that into to fruition. Um, so, uh, you know, that there are, we, we have the opportunity potentially to uh, source uh, green electrons uh, from, you know, with some kind of a power purchase agreement, or as an integrator, again, we're actually speaking with a, a tech company that uh, can quantify, you know, through, you know, their, their knowledge of what's actually on the grid and at a very local level, uh, you know, the, the presence of green electrons or not on that system. So we're looking at these are, as different ways to take advantage of the uh, incentive uh, uh, production tax credit uh, that has been put forth in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, because uh, clearly there's a big incentive to do that uh, up to $3 uh, per kilogram on hydrogen, which could, you know, come right, right off of, uh, you know, trying to support even lower prices for hydrogen or providing more margin for our company. Just a clarifying question there. What is the payback period on on your uh, electrolyzer for, for the customer? Yeah, well, so the customer is not purchasing our, our system. Uh, okay. you know, there They're are some who've it. spoken that would like to, but we're, we're, we mm -hmm. would like to provide hydrogen and fueling as a service, as I've indicated, so that we have that carry uh, going forward into the future on you know all of the fueling that, that, that takes place. Um, so... Uh, but but that said, you know, I've indicated that, you know, we're looking at the potential of, you know, but, you know as our systems, you know, as uh, customers grow out of our systems, we can, you know, add on additional modules. But at some point, it's just not the most effective way uh, to, to, to deliver or produce hydrogen in that particular location. Uh, so we could consider moving that. Um, you know, we're looking also at, you know, how long would the term of, 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 of uh, required offtake uh, exist for a customer. And we're thinking that we can get payback in the three, three and a half year type of, uh, of time frame on those. Got it. Thank you. When do you assume hydrogen will reach relative price parity with other fuels? Yeah, so I mean, it's certainly the uh, spike in diesel pricing over the last couple of years has helped out. 
uh, significantly. The efficiency, uh, the greater efficiency of running a fuel cell electric vehicle versus a combustion uh, engine helps out. Uh, you know, right now, roughly, you know, $5 equivalent uh, diesel per gallon uh, in the U.S. equates to, you know, roughly $10 hydrogen. Um, the historical price for hydrogen in California at the retail pump has been $16 uh, per kilogram and has spiked up to $25. Um, we see, you know, we, we don't do any of our modeling based on anything. You know, the highest we do it is at that $16 uh, rate. And we want to be able to bring it down from there. And that's really a function of that, uh, that equipment utilization. Uh, as we start getting into you know, 80, 90 percent, uh, we're, we're starting to get into a place where we maybe can provide you know, 11 or 12 dollar hydrogen, which gets close to diesel parity um, and can do so with, really without you know, these, these wild swings in prices as well uh, that we see in, uh, in diesel and gasoline. 